Hey, BioSci 101. This is Dr. Georgie with Lecture 7 on light. Light is what we use in light microscopy, including fluorescence microscopy. So what is light? Light is a form of energy. And what kind of energy, you might say? <laughs> well, this is what we get from physics. It's oscillating electric and magnetic fields that travel perpendicular to one another. Oscillating means they change. So sometimes there's more, there's less. As you can see, it changes with a beautiful, easy, steady rhythm. And what you've got drawn here is the electrical field, the electric field. But there's a corresponding magnetic field that is at 90 degree angles. And this is showing you with a black line, the wave direction. So it's known as EM radiation or EM energy because it's electrical and it's magnetic. In truth, we pretty much from now on ignore the magnetic field, although it exists. And we talk about the electric. I think I'm missing an R in that or somebody did. They wrote eclectic. Well, whatever. Anyway, it's a little bit misspelled, but <laughs> The main thing is that you know that it's oscillating EM energy. And um, they oscillate, as you can see, as sine waves. You're going to notice that this lecture is a little more chock-full on the standard uh, science uh, jargon. And if you're just going, I've never heard of sine waves, or that was so many years ago, don't worry about it too much. This I kind of throw a lot at you in this lecture because light is something we've all thought about and heard about. And there's um, this is the tip of the iceberg of what we know. So this is light as you as a microscopist need to know it. Now, I'm not going to quiz you on, just so you know, I'm not going to be like, just explain a, a sine wave. What I want you to know is not so much the uh, smaller yet important details of this lecture, but to get a general sense of how much is known and understood about light and also what isn't known and understood. And just have in the back of your mind that when we talk about light, it's something that's been studied immensely throughout the history of humanity. We've all experienced light, obviously. Um, and um, even if you can't see it visually, you can feel it on your skin, those kind of things. So it's hugely important to life on Earth. And it's also something that we use in microscopy, of course. So the electrical and magnetic fields are, like I said, they're called E and B, and they're perpendicular to each other. And they have the exact same phase and amplitude. And these there are these lovely regular sine waves. Basically, this slide I'm not going to quiz you on, but it's good for you to know. They're known as transverse waves, waves that oscillate perpendicular to the direction of travel. It's just beautiful, right? It's amazing how much organization and information there is be behind something as simple yet as profound as light. So here's a really important concept when we get to light. We know so much about it. We have so many ways of measuring it and of using it and poets describe it and physics people describe it, optics describes it, microscopists describe it, biologists describe it because we need it for life on earth. Um, there's so many ways, you know, artists describe it, of course. Um, there's so many ways to describe and understand and think about and look at light and we don't really know what it is. This is my take home as a biologist looking at physics and going physics or even chemistry, but can you explain light? And this is the, and they, they'll say yes, and maybe they're right, but this is just my opinion. We still don't really understand it completely because here's the thing. <laughs> we understand it a lot, but I think there's a lot more and to be understood about the planet and the world uh, in physics. We're figuring out new things every day. So um, my criteria is if you can't describe it simply, then it's probably 
uh, you should probably haven't understood it fully because there's this kind of like things look simple and then you dig deeper and then it's like a complicated mess and then you keep digging and then you realize it's simple again and so there's this rhythm to discovery and I think we're in the middle of the you know part two the complicated mess when it comes to light okay so light can be referred to or described as or classified as photons photons are individual packets of light they're particles, uh, uh, particle physics. It's an individual, there is a photon, there are two photons, there are three photons. This is how we think about light when we're talking about the cameras uh, for digital imaging for microscopy. There's that CCD chip in your CCD camera, and there's pixels, and there's a certain number of photons that hit that part, of uh, that pixel, that part of the uh, chip, and if it's 3,000 photons, then we call it gray level um, 233. And it's 4,023 photons, then it ends up being gray level something else, basically. <laughs> uh, so when we're doing the math, when we're figuring out things like cameras, digital cameras, um, then light is photons. And we think about all of the math around individual particles and the randomness of it and signal to noise and so on. When we describe how a microscope works in terms of the optics, like I just did with fluorescence microscopy, we think about light, uh, light as waves. And sometimes actually <laughs> when we are really diving into the optics of this system and how the shape of the beautiful glass that is used in our objectives and so on magnifies things and so on we use it's something called geometric optics and we use rays and we draw things as beams so there's three ways really to look at light and they're all correct and to call something a photon a particle and a wave at the same time is sort of the opposite thing, <laughs> you know, is it a wave? Is it a continuous fluctuation of energy? Or is it, you know, packets of energy called photons? And um, the equations are different. The, the approach is different. But in truth, it is all of that. You can describe it at all, as all of that. And I know some people would say, I kind of agree, like waves is supersedes everything else. Like photons is a simplistic way of looking at waves. But if you will, um, well, as you go through this and as you look at the stuff we're gonna talk about today, you can see how sometimes you wanna describe it as waves because there's properties that waves have that definitely show up when we're talking about microscopy. And however, when we get to the digital cameras, we're like, no, 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 let's think about photons. So what is it? It's all of that. Light is light. It knows what it is. It's EM energy or radiation. Um, and this is how we describe it. And this is just to show you a ray or beam because you've seen the wave, you can think of a photon, you've probably heard of photons. And like I said, it's used in geometric optics, which is um, light going through the study of light going through optical lenses. Okay, and so photons, like I said, they are particles, they're qu quantum mechanics, you may have heard of. It's looking at things um, in terms of discrete packets of energy, discrete meaning they're unique, you can define it, here's a one. It's just like when we were on the histogram, we were counting um, fruits in our fridge right and they're like there's an orange that's one orange <laughs> we can tell an orange from one other that's a discrete object it's not a continuum of oranges i don't know where the orange begins or ends um it's the same way when we think about photons they're particles of light they're little packets they're quantal packets of energy and um although in reality light is both a wave and a photon. So both work, both types of physics work to describe light, which is part of why I find it so wonderful and fascinating. Okay, so as you already know, 
when we um, think about light as a wave, then we've got features that kick in like the wavelength, which we register in our retina and our biological system as color. And it's the distance from the peak to the peak, hence the frequency. How often, physicists talk about how often a peak would pass you if you're one spot observing it. So that's where I came up with the, you know, what if you're waiting for a bus metaphor. And um, again, we experience it as color because our neural system decodes it. Like there's, we basically have <laughs> a retina, if you will. <laughs> It is kind of like a CCD camera, only much, much more complicated and also alive with blood in it. Um, but we've got different cells in our retina that respond to different wavelengths of light. And then your brain does this amazing elaborate computational effort to reconstruct um, the data that is coming from your retina. And it's extraordinary. The more we look, the more we realize that that data of like this part of the retina was hit this much, this often, et cetera, it's deconstructed in different parts of your brain. And there's like a zillion maps of the world as you look out where you're like, oh, here's all the right edges. Here's all the left edges. Oh, here's all the light yellow spots. Here's all the <laughs> bright red spots. And then your brain, different parts of your brain process that info and then it reconstructs everything together to, create what you see as an image. So our brains and the, uh, the ability to see things is extraordinary and complicated and wonderful. And um, we'll come back to the kind of light we use in a little bit. But basically, when we experience color, there's a lot that goes into it. But what we're responding to is the wavelength of light. And this is a great field, by the way, uh, to go into if you're interested. I think some of you said you're interested in neurobiology and it's just a great field of neurobiology to look at how we see things and um, how we can use that to cure blindness. There's a lot of new exciting um, so possible solutions out there right now for that and also um, just generally understanding our brains is just incredibly fascinating. Okay, so um, when we characterize light as a wave, we not only get wavelength and color, we also get amplitude. So this is showing you two, um, two waves of light that are the exact same color, but one, the one on the left is much brighter than the one on the right. The one on the right has less amplitude, so it's not as bright. And we register, we're able to perceive amplitude of waves and we register it as intensity and brightness when it's using our own eyes. When we um, are talking about a digital image, that's translated also by your lookup table and other things. Okay, so both the wavelength and the amplitude contribute to the overall energy of the light. Um, but <laughs> as I said before, we sort of, we just, we generally remember that, that the um, short wavelengths are the higher frequency as just a, I mean, it's true, but then if you wanna be more complete, you're gonna also factor in the amplitude. Okay, so waves, again, uh, waves of light, just the E field is shown. When we're looking at this, we're just looking at the E field, not the magnetic, just the electrical. Um, part because there is an exact replica of this wave at 90 degrees that um, is the magnetic field. And we basically don't deal with that in microscopy, uh, not to this point in time anyway. And again, amplitude versus wavelength, this is just reinforcing these really important concepts. And um, sometimes, people will draw this to show an entire beam of light instead of just one color. Sometimes this is a stand, like sometimes you're looking at a drawing like this and they're drawing you the exact wavelength. But 
light, when you see it, is often usually a mix of a lot of wavelengths. So true white light, and this is important for uh, understanding microscopy, true white light is all the colors equally. We often, we don't usually have true white light. If you're, um, I, I think these days we kind of understand it more because we all have, um, you know, digital cameras on our phones. But I was gonna say, if you're doing digital photography or photography in general, you know that white light is, there's so many types of white light, right? There's yellowish, there's bluish, there's light, um, we call them light temperatures, which you'll see on the scopes too. Um, so all the light we're looking at is a mix of different colors. And this is a side note, but, um, the fluorescent light bulbs that we have often in, you know, various locations. Um, <laughs> I'm used to being in the classroom. I just point up to that because we have fluorescent bulbs in there. Those are those are actually there are that's fluorescence happening, but it's a lot of types. There's a lot of fluorophores by my definition. They don't call them that in. in industrial lighting, but there's basically fluores fluorescing is happening in those bulbs, but it's just so many colors that you get this mostly white light, yellowish white. Okay, so um, the wavelength is important because it tells us color, but when we're doing microscopy, we need to know that the wavelength also affects how deep into the sample your light can go. So the longer the wavelength, the more, it's actually less energy, it's shedding less energy, it can travel deeper, which is something that comes up in um, a type of imaging called two photon imaging, because we use really long wavelengths of light and they're less harmful actually because they're less energetic so they're less harmful to the specimen and um, they travel deeper they travel even 300 microns into specimens most of the light visible light we use can only travel just a little bit just a few microns into your specimen before it's totally absorbed and so you can't like shine a light on someone's skin and affect their kidneys. <laughs> I have like a lot of alternate treatments, but that one is really hand waving when they're like, I'll shine a light and it'll affect, it'll, it'll stimulate your kidneys. I'm like, my skin absorbs all the light. There's no light going to your kidneys, okay? As microscopists, we are working really hard to get red light or actually, um, IR light, 900 nanometers, to penetrate 300 microns into our specimen, you know, and that's a big victory if we can illuminate something 300 microns deep. Um, also, there's something known as the red-blue shift, and the because the wavelengths are different, when they come out, they actually hit your sensor in a different way at a different time. There's a there's a shift between them that is, we used to talk about a lot, but it's mostly corrected. And it's it's not a big deal in wide field microscopy. When you get into confocal microscopy and you're kind of, you've got better resolution, it's something that comes up again. So anyway, it's important to know, the bottom line is it's important to understand that different colors of light are physically different wavelengths and that gives them different physical properties. And again, this is an example of amplitude. So again, here you see the same color, um, two uh, waves of the same color of light. And instead of side by side, this time they are overlapping. So you can see that, yes, they are exactly the same wavelength. However, they are different amplitudes. One is dimmer than the other. Now, here's a new concept. Well, I've referred to it a little bit before, but I think this shows it to you in the best possible way. So when you're comparing two beams of light that you know we're just gonna diagram as a single wave each, they can have the same wavelength. They can have the same amplitude but 
they can be slightly out of phase with each other. This is two uh, waves of light that are slightly out of phase. So you can see they have the same amplitude, the same wavelength, they're the same color, they're the same intensity, but one is slightly behind the other, okay? Using the buses metaphor, this is two buses that both can hold 50 people. They're the same size bus. And um, they um, each come every five minutes and they each hold 50 people. So they're not a mini bus or a, they're just a whatever that, you know, they're the same size bus basically. However, one comes at four o'clock and then four five, four ten, four fifteen. The other one comes at four oh one, four sixteen, wait, four oh one, four oh six, four eleven, four sixteen, etc. So the other one, still every five minutes, still the same route. St uh, still the same size bus for 50 passengers, just making up a number. But one, one comes one minute before the other. So each come every five minutes, one comes at four, the other comes at 401. Wouldn't it be great to have such a good bus system? Anyway, that's an aside. Um, so <laughs> that's a phase difference. Now, we're not used to thinking about phase differences because our eyes cannot tell. Like this, of all the data that your eyes collect from light, which is a ton of data, the one thing that, that your eyes ignore is phase differences. However, microscopes with just pieces of glasses in, in there and all sorts of fun tricks can detect phase differences and read it out to you as intensity differences. And that is, of course, phase microscopy, DIC microscopy. These contrast generating techniques exploit phase differences in light. Why do you get phase differences? Well, you start with a light source where all the light is in phase, and then you transmit it through your specimen and it gets knocked out of phase because parts of your specimen are thicker and uh, are denser and have different properties. And so you get an image that is basically a phase map of your specimen. And it's pretty exciting and informative. Okay, so backing up a second to light itself. Um, there's something known as the EM spectrum because light is not the only form of EM radiation. Visible light is just the part of it that our own eyes respond to. But <laughs> gamma rays, x-rays, UV light, IR light, microwaves, and radio waves, they are all part of the EM spectrum, they are all just different wavelengths of the same energy, the same deal with a, a, an E and a, and a, you know, phase. everything I've just described to you about light is true of all these other forms of what we call EM radiation. So they're just different wavelengths. That's all they are. I, this always blows my mind every time I talk about it. It's just that our eyeballs respond to visible light, and so do a lot of, um, you know, well fluorophores and and various molecules in, in plants and so on. Anyway, a lot of things, a lot of life responds to what we call visible light plus UV and infrared. We, you might be aware right now about how UV light. Um, kills a lot of life. It's a great disinfectant and we use it, we've been using it in tissue culture for ages and now because of the pandemic I see people selling it, um, which is, uh, part of me is like about time, you know, like for home use, et cetera. And the other part of me is like, this is dangerous. This is tanning booths, by the way, use UV light. This is, um, you also have to sort of leave it there, leave it on the thing. It's not an instant color of life. But anyway, here is the EM spectrum. It starts with gamma rays. They are super high energy. And guess what? They are super dangerous to life, okay? Because <laughs> they're, they're just 
super, super high frequency, high energy waves. X-rays, well, we know <laughs> that, that we use X-rays in medical diagnostics, right? And we also know that you X-ray something too much, you might hurt it, kill it, harm it. So we got to be careful, but they're, they've you know, made so much of medicine possible. Um, and we might actually try to irradiate things on purpose like tumors and kill them, right? So then we get UV light, then we get visible light with our lovely rainbow that we already know about from 400 to 700 nanometers from purple to blue to green to yellow to orange to red. Then IR light, um, which those kind of those heat seeking devices, um, you know, night vision goggles, they're using IR, IR light plus some microscopes use both UV and IR light. Then on a continuum, same properties, just less frequent of a wavelength, really that's the all, we get microwaves, <laughs> which uh, I think I have a slide, but it basically, they heat, heat up the water in your food. That's what your microwave oven is doing for you, is um, water responds to microwaves and gets starts moving around, makes things hot. And then, Yes, on the same spectrum, but just bigger waves, which, oh, wait, they can travel long distances. Aha, uh -huh, we get radio waves. So um, just for your own information, when these different um, forms of EM radiation or uh, things on the EM spectrum hit matter, they have different effects, you know, so gamma rays ionize things. Um, you saw the visible light does the, the electronic excitation, it excites electrons and you get fluorophores, the Jablonski diagram and so on. So um, they have different effects on chemistry basically depending on the uh, the frequency of the wavelength. This is a really fun little graphic showing you uh, it's flipped by the way if you notice now gamma rays I can't find one with gamma rays on the left but gamma rays are on the um, far right now <laughs> and then x-rays showing you different things you can do with x-rays and then you've got uv you know, like i said a suntan or yeah dental uh curing dental um materials um they should put microscopes on there but they don't uh, for shame uh but <laughs> But anyway, here's how we use um, various uh, various different wavelengths, you know, to cook our food or Wi-Fi or broadcast TV or radio, or of course doing ultrasounds. Um, we also use ultrasound uh, wavelengths for um, for a type of microscopy, actually, there's really cool things. And of course, sound waves um, are, believe it or not, very related to light. Um, we just, different parts uh, of our body are able to respond to sound waves. So they seem completely different to us, but um, it's the general thing of a part of your body and some cells are able to respond and then your brain decodes them. And um, at the top, you sort of have a size reference of, so that you can sort of understand the relative differences in the lengths of the uh, wavelength. Sorry, it says man's height, but it's a human height. But anyway, here's a fun chart to just know that we're using all of these different wavelengths in different ways. And there's an animation you can check out that's kind of fun. Here's another one. These are all the FSU site by Davidson. Um, there's just tons of great info in that website. Okay, here we go talking about what happens when light hits matter. So we're going to dial it back in and just look at visible light again. And then what happens when it comes across your specimen? The answer is many, many, many things can happen. And in microscopy, they kind of all happen. So when light hits your matter or your specimen, it can be reflected. It can bounce off of it, basically. 
it can be absorbed partially or entirely. But if it's partially absorbed, it can go through your specimen and then come out as transmitted. While it's going through your specimen, the light, some of it gets absorbed. So less light comes out. Um, and we obviously know it can fluoresce, but we're gonna put that aside for the moment. And we're gonna think about the fact as it goes past different parts of your specimen, it also gets refracted and diffracted. All of those contribute to the light that is coming out. So the light that goes into your specimen comes out completely different. And that's what a microscope is seeing. It's looking at the light that came out and going, what happened? Did it get refracted? Did it get diffracted? Did the phase shift? <laughs> Did it fluoresce? Oh my God, let me record this. Reflected light, uh, we obviously also capture that with fluorescence, right? Uh, we tend not to do transmitted light fluorescence because it mostly gets absorbed because of that whole thing I was telling you about of like it just, um, for a variety of reasons, you, we use reflected light for fluorescence, um, mostly having to do with, well, that's the way the scopes were de designed, but also we get the most signal that way. Reflected light, by the way, is also how we see things. Like if you were looking at me in real life, um, you would see, I happen to be wearing a blue shirt. I know you're not seeing it on the screen, but um, you would be seeing that because the blue light is bouncing off of me. I'm absorbing the other colors and what you see is what's reflected back at your own eyes. So that's how reflected light is how we see most of the world. And also why, like if I was standing in front of you, you can't see, and I put a flashlight behind myself, <laughs> like a, my lower back, you probably couldn't see it because it can't be transmitted through my entire body. Um, but if you think of the pulse socks that we use in hospitals, I love that thing. It's a, you put it on your finger, right? And you shine light through your finger and it actually is figuring out what light got transmitted from one side of your finger to the other, it shines light through your fingers and um, enough light makes it out that somehow, I, I think it reflects, but anyway, but it is able to use the information about how the light was altered to figure out the oxygenation rate of your blood. Okay, so as I said before, one thing that can happen when light interacts with stuff, with matter, with non-light, <laughs> basically it can be reflected. When it is reflected um, sort of perfectly in a very predictable way off of a smooth surface and it produces this high fidelity, high resolution image. We call that specular reflection. It means mirror, honestly. So polished metal, still water mirrors. What usually happens is diffuse reflection, which is a hard to predict reflection off of a rough surface and there's haze and glare and think about crumpled aluminum foil, wavy water or more relevant cells. <laughs> okay, so this is just shows you light bouncing off of a perfect flat surface and you can calculate all the angles of how the light's gonna get reflected and what you're gonna see versus diffuse reflection, good luck figuring out what's going to come off of that. Here's, um, you know, a still lake, you see a smooth water surface, but the minute it goes wavy, you're not going to see the reflected mountain in that because the light's bouncing in a zillion directions. It's not giving you that perfect little image um, back at you. So we know a lot about the math and the physics of reflection. And um, the cool thing about it is that whatever angle the light hits the material at, it's going to bounce off in at the same angle. So the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Again, for those of you who are still a little math phobic, don't be, but I won't quiz you on this. Um, but just so you know, it's Snell's Law and it's really cool. And what I want you to understand is we can calculate this. But again, like with that wavy light, this is happening. This physics is still happening. It's just that there's so many, like it's not a flat surface. And so things are hitting that water with so many angles that calculating it is ridiculous. 
So, but if we're talking about a smooth surface, we can do a lot of math to it, put a lot of math to it, and we do. There's actually some microscopy that uses this that is called TIRF, T-I-R-F. It uses it in a really interesting way. Okay, so there's your FSU um, little interactive to think about reflection, to reflect on reflection, uh-huh. Okay, <laughs> now let's think about when light hits matter and it gets absorbed. So what, what does that mean? It means that the amplitude goes down in one or more of the wavelengths and you see whatever is left as transmitted or maybe reflected light, just, you know, all these things can happen. These are all possibilities and usually they're all happening. So it's complicated, but fun. And it fully absorbed, obviously the light's not gonna be transmitted. And here's a great little graphic on absorption. It's showing you some opaque material. It's gonna be opaque because light is, absor it's absorbing light. And so you're gonna shine light and not a lot is gonna come out of it, <laughs> okay? The opaque just means it absorbs light or reflects it, to be honest. But basically, if you're on the other side, you're not gonna see a lot of light. And so it's just showing you light, you know, you're getting less as you go from opaque to opaque thing. You get utter darkness. Um, oh, this was uh, what I already told you. How do we actually see light? We see light depending on how it interacts. But what we're usually seeing is that some colors are absorbed. So here's a light bulb and something green. The light bulb is sending a lot of colors of light, you know, more or less whitish, yellowish white. And all those colors are getting absorbed except for the green which is, it's bouncing back. So this isn't new green light that is chemically produced. There's not fluorescence. It's not that um, that piece of paper is fluorescing. It's just that it's literally reflecting the green light and the other ones it's absorbing. And that's because there's some pigments in there that absorb everything but green. So we see what wasn't absorbed. We're like, oh, that piece of paper is green. Well, actually it absorbed all the other colors and the only one left to see is green. Um, so chemistry of absorbed light. There's different ways to absorb light. And if it's really quickly re-emitted as light of a long, of a, yes, longer wavelength, less energy, then we call it, we can call it fluorescence. I mean, the whole electrons jumping up has to happen. But this is an easy way to tell these different things is by their lifetime. And basically, if it's a matter of, of what do I mean by rapidly? I mean nanoseconds. I mean, it looks instant to us, except for these flim scopes that can actually tell you, you know, was it one nanosecond or two nanoseconds? Oh, wait, it's a different thing if it was, you know, two nanoseconds. But for us, with our ability to detect time, it's almost instant. It's basically super fast. Like you shine the light there, it fluoresces. If it takes uh, seconds to minutes to give us a, a, also a different light, then it's known as phosphorescence. Um, this is some old light bulbs. This is uh, some bioluminescent, well, it depends, but something, sometimes we see it in nature, um, you know, the old glow-in-the-dark objects and papers and stuff like that. That was um, phosphorescence, that phenomenon. I think fireflies use phosphorescence. No, they use bioluminescence, which is they chemically create the light. Anyway, if, if we quite slowly minutes, seconds and minutes, re-radiated as infrared waves, that's what we call heat, actually. <laughs> so IR, um, that's why IR cameras see people versus objects, because we're um, giving off heat, we're giving off IR waves. And sometimes what happens is you transform it into chemical energy and break chemical bonds, and chemistry happens. And that happens in a lot of biological processes too. So you've seen the Jablonski diagram that describes um, fluorescence, so I'm not going to go over it again. 
And we're going to switch to a totally new topic here, which is the refractive index. Again, a really important topic for microscopy, but again, about how light interacts with matter, with stuff, with your specimen. So let's think about the speed of light. You've heard about the speed of light. Nothing goes faster, right? <laughs> More or less. Anyway, in a vacuum, in other words, there's nothing in its way, <laughs> not even air, because air can slow down light. Light travels at the speed of light, which is um, known as C, and it's a constant speed, and it's very, very fast. And um, C is equal to the uh, wavelength times the frequency of oscillation, which is why for light to travel at this same speed, um, thing, the shorter wavelengths have to be more frequent. Okay, just to make it up, make everything perfect. But C is as fast as light can possibly travel, the speed of light, basically. But here's the thing that gets confused and not clearly described a lot of the time. When light goes through stuff, including air, it slows down. It's the fastest it can be when it's in a vacuum. When it goes through stuff like your specimen, like a piece of glass, as might be shown here, glass or plastic, it actually does slow down. And sometimes the textbooks are even wrong on this because it, it does slow down in air. It's just so tiny an amount that it's like, ah, is it really slower? Well, yeah, it is. It's just not important, not in any important fashion for most of us. So it does start to matter when it travels through glass or your specimens, because guess what? It's traveling at a different rate through the cover slip and the slide than it is traveling through your specimen. And what we see because of this is it enters or exits a different medium, a different type of matter like air to glass or glass to specimen. Um, your specimen probably is mostly uh, water, especially if it's live tissue or live cells. Um, as it goes from one type of stuff into another type, is it traveling in its journey? It goes different speeds. And what that ends up looking like is exactly what you're seeing here, which is it looks like it, it's going at different angles. So as you shine light into a piece of glass, it will get refracted, which means, it actually means it slows down, but it means that the angle changes a little bit. It's sort of, I've heard of people talking like, uh, as if it's walking through mud versus walking through a field of grass or something, you know. It's doing what it does, but at a slightly slower pace. And so this brings us to refraction, it basically, what ends up functionally happening is that glass will bend light. Water to air will bend light. At the interface between two different um, mediums, we call them, there's a bending of light that happens. And each kind of matter, each like glass, your specimen, water, etc. Everything has what is called a refractive index, and it's known as n. n is the refractive index. And so when it goes from the n of water into the n of glass into the n of air, there's a bend that happens at each point because the glass, water, and air have different refractive indices. Denser materials kind of slow down light more, so they have a higher n. The higher the n, the um, that means your material is slowing down light a little bit more. Again, light is so super fast, you know, it's not a big thing, except that it ends up giving us these, these, this bending that goes on, and we have to take that into account in microscopy. And also note that the refractive index is dependent on the wavelength. So that does matter to it. And there's no units for refractive index because it's actually the speed of light in a vacuum 
divided by the speed of light in whatever it is that you're talking about, whatever you're assigning the end to. So let's look at some refractive indices. In a vacuum, it's one because the speed of light divided by in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in a vacuum is one. In air, I wrote one up here. What? <laughs> but yeah, I said it slowed down. Well, that's because it's uh, you got. I'm only ending with two significant digits. You got to keep going for a few till you see the change. So it's pretty close. Depends on your perspective. But water, whoa, is 1.3. In glass, it's 1.5. 1.5. In immersion oil, the kind that we use for microscopes is special and super clear and super good for our purposes, not just your Crisco or olive oil from your kitchen. Um, it's also 1.5. This may be giving you a hint, I hope, as to why we use immersion oil and why we bother because it's so uh, messy to clean up. Because remember, your specimen it's the light that goes through your specimen first goes through air, then it hits the glass of your slide or cover slip, depending on what direction, then it goes through your specimen, then it goes through your cover slip, and then it goes through maybe air again, or maybe immersion oil, and then it goes through the glass of your objective. It's bending every single time. This is why if we can stop the bending by putting some immersion oil in there instead of air, then it goes through glass and immersion oil, they have the same refractive index, there's no bending, there's, um, and that's just, that's good uh, for us. So guess what, memorize this chart, know that vacuum air are kind of the same, water is 1.3 and glass and immersion oil are 1.5, it's just really important for you to know as a microscopist. I think I have, here we go. There's the, <laughs> there's the air. So, you know, it's 1.000278. It is not quite one. It is different than one, but yeah, for a biologist, that's pretty close. Um, and again, water. So when I quiz you, you can give me this whole number or you can give me one. I'll accept either for air. Water, again, 1.33. Um, optical glass, 1.51. If it's the best, the most expensive, it, you know, we're just going to go with that. Just for comparison, this one you don't have to memorize. A diamond, <laughs> 2.43. Um, again, that's why a diamond's, a, that's part of why a diamond's a diamond. And, you know, it gives you all those little sparkles and refraction and so on. So Light travels a little bit more slowly through materials with a high refractive index. Now, cells, yeah, I mean, we can say they're kind of mostly water in 1.33. That's an approximation. But the truth is, all that bouncing around that it's doing in cells, in different parts of the cells, have different refractive index. It's going to read out as your image. That's what your image is. Well, big part of what your image is. OK? so. You need to know the refractive index of everything you can control in your light path. So that's why the you have to use certain glass for the cover slip and slide. You sometimes want to use immersion oil. You want to think carefully about this in the design of your microscope. And then you're going to put your specimen in there. This is why, if you can, you want your specimen to be wet because it, you're just going to be able to image it better. This is really important when you're doing microscopes at home. Always put a little drop of something with your specimen. You'll just get much better images if your specimen is in some sort of fluid. Okay, so when light hits matter, one of the things that can happen, it can be refracted, which means it bends as it passes from one material to another. And the refractive index of the material that you're looking at, that you're using, is really important to keep track of in microscopy. Oops, went back. Um, there's a lot online you can look up about this that'll show you, you know, you can put a straw in a glass of water at home and be like, oh, I guess light does appear to bend <laughs> as it goes in that interface between water and air. That's what's going on. It's not like the straw actually bent, it's your image of the straw. Um, 
is slightly not accurate, to be honest, because of refraction. You're like, I know the straw's over here, but it's, you know, same thing with a fish. It's like the real fish is somewhere else than where you think it is, where it's showing it to you. And a straw is lovely because we see half of it where it really is, and we see half of it where um, refraction is making us think it is. And um, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the law of reflection is not Snell's law. Snell's law is the one about refraction. So there's beautiful physics and math around refraction. Again, um, we can know the angle and we can know the refractive index and then we can figure out um, how the ray is gonna be bent and what's gonna happen, which is great when we have things like air to glass and we know what the glass is. But when you're talking about light going through cells or tissues, then there are so many different refractive indices in that specimen that the only thing you can do is look at your image, which is a map of refractive indices, basically. Also, depending on the scope, a map of phase differences. <laughs> also, depending on the scope, a map of fluorescence. <laughs> so I hope you're getting the idea that scopes do a lot of fun and complicated things for us. And they're not just magnifying glasses. Uh, so there's something known as the critical angle, which again is a hint towards a type of microscopy known as turf. But this is a fun little diagram of, depending on the angle of light, as it's going from one um, medium to another, you can get different bends in it. Play around at home with this. You can test this at home with the straw and so on. And again, here's some uh, little links that you can use. And we're now moving on to the other big exciting uh, trick, if you will. I don't know that it's a trick, but the other thing that light does that matters to us a lot in imaging, it diffracts. So let's take a breath. Let's just throw out everything we just heard. And let's focus entirely on an unusual situation. And yet, it, actually, that's a bad word for it, a unique situation, because this happens all the time. But what happens when light hits an edge of something, including <laughs> that of like a small hole, which is the original edge, basically? What happens? is that light gets diffracted because light is a wave. This is where we like to think of light as a wave. And in the 1800s, Ernst Abbey figured out what a microscopy image is, what a microscope image is. And he figured out that diffraction is really key in microscopy. It's one of the most important things actually it's also important to you because every image you ever see with your own eyes is diffracted. So what is diffraction? Well, let's think about just any old wave. It could be a gamma wave, a microwave. It could be an ocean wave because this is how they first figured it out. And they still do a lot of these tests in big water tanks. So you see this time the wave is drawn as a series of you know, lines basically. And so here's this nice lovely wave, just really evenly going straight through the water. Let's think of this as a water wave, but it's the same if it were light. Um, and then you put, you block it, you put a wall in its way, but there's just one small hole in that wall. So now there's two edges that it needs to contend with suddenly. And what you get as the wave comes out on the other side, so we're looking at the blue uh, diagram here, is a lot of bending and curving. And you're, the wave is coming out with these curves that ever expand. Okay, that's the exact pattern. That's a diffraction pattern. Again, it's something that we've described mathematically. We've seen a lot. Create a little wave tank, take a, 
like a, what do you call those little plastic containers, you know, for sandwiches, um, take one of those at home and create the situation, you know, create a little wave and see what happens. Put an aperture, put some food coloring into it so it's more fun. Um, don't believe me, in other words, make sure you think this is true, but we've known this since like the 1600s because there were people doing this and figuring it out since then. And these show some other, uh, at, over here on the in the yellow on the left, we've got some edge situations going on that you know, are a little bit different. But basically, if you put something in the way of a wave, let's say a rock, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's going to crash around the way uh, the wave's going to crash around that rock, right? We can see it when we go to the coast here in California. Um, it's not going to keep going straight. It's going to crash and curl around the rock. The one on the bottom might be a rock basically here. So these are all diffraction patterns that um, happen when a straight wave hits an edge. And then it gets even more fun when let's this time we're just going to take light and light bulb if you put a light bulb and create some light hitting a opaque piece of paper with two holes again you can try and do this at home and um there's lots of demos about this online if you want to check it out um, so this is a famous uh, two-slit experiment that was done a long time ago um, important part of physics. And basically what you're going to see is the light going through each of those little holes, those apertures, does its diffraction thing. But then those two diffraction patterns interact with each other. And the image that you're going to get is actually a dotted image because there's areas where those waves interact with each other and cancel each other out. That's called destructive interference. And then it goes dark. And then there's areas where you get constructive interference where the waves sum up and it gets brighter. So although you had an, just an even bit of light if you shine it through this dark thing with just two holes, two little slits, you will get not two slits out as your image, but you will get a pattern. You will get a dot, 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 like bright, dim, bright, dim, bright, dim, bright, dim. This is what the microscope image is. Um, and also how resolution works and also why you never can ever ever see the world as clear as it actually is because any image you see is actually refracted through um, the aperture in your eyes and so you actually see everything with less resolution than really it, than it originally was um, and I'm trying to see if I, okay, we will come back to this when we talk about Abby and uh, the description of what an image is, but start thinking about this, checking it out online, playing with it at home, uh, testing it out, seeing if this is true. And we're gonna come back to the many things that happen when light interacts with matter. And when, <laughs> When we metaphorically, I think this is us throwing up our hands and saying, I don't know, it's too complicated, but refraction and diffraction um, are both wavelength dependent. And so when white light, oh, this is dispersion, sorry, scatter is when we throw up our hands. So dispersion is actually what happens is um, when light gets separated out by different colors because refraction and diffraction are happening. Refraction and diffraction are always happening. Well, refraction, if you're going from different mediums, so air into glass or liquid or something like that, diffraction happens anytime there's an edge or a hole, which um, your cover slip is not gonna diffract things, or your glass, right? It's just glass. Um, I guess the edges would, but we're not looking at those. But your specimen is diffracting all over the place. There's all sorts of apertures and edges that are happening in your actual specimen. So, and then sometimes the, because all of this is also wavelength dependent, 
the white light gets separated into different colors and then you get a prism <laughs> okay like if it's really well done and you say you can you know this is seen as proof of yeah all of, uh, this is happening so and we use prisms in microscopy too scatter scatter is what i was talking about where we throw up our hands and just go oh all of that's happening so uh why is the sky blue because blue light is scattered in all directions and so no matter where we go we see blue sky i mean we don't see the other colors of the light if there aren't clouds um so scatter is basically what is really happening and light kind of just going in a zillion directions we don't want scatter inside our scope like the components like dust in your scope will cause scatter scatter is going to happen as it goes through the specimen that's the image you're looking at basically but when we talk about it in an actual microscope we're not talking about the scatter that of course is happening in your specimen that's the point you're going to get an image thanks to it um if somebody mentions it about microscopy they're talking about um light uh wandering off inside the other com the components of your microscope so not in your actual specimen but you're directing light along all all into all sorts of places like for instance a bulb you've got to direct it through the base of the microscope the light from the bulb and then up and then after it goes in through the objectives you've got to direct it around till it gets to the oculars or the camera and so if things are out of alignment you you scatter is bad when you're talking about the light path in your microscope scatter in a specimen is inevitable and we don't even talk about it so Summing up, <laughs> transmitted light as it passes through an object can be refracted, diffracted by the edges of the opaque portions and structures nearly as small as the wavelengths of light. In case you're wondering what are all these opportunities for diffraction inside of a specimen, lots of diffraction happening. And that's okay because we can therefore see small structures. Again, not magnification, it, that's not what's happening. It's diffraction that's giving us the microscope image. Um, here's some more examples, just you know, to have some good examples. Um, transparent objects are called transparent because they transmit a lot of the light. Um, opaque objects tend to absorb light. Reflective objects like a mirror mostly reflect the light. Nothing is 100%, okay? This is just like the main effect of an object. And um, just, you know, object names, again, opaque means they absorb light, transparent transmits it, reflective reflects it, and scattering objects diffract the light. So our specimens are scattering objects. There is a new way to turn things opaque, which is called Clarity Pro. It's a specimen prep, I mean, uh, tr to turn spe opaque specimens into transparent specimens. It's pretty cool. Um, our biological specimens are mostly not transparent because they of the fats and the type of fats in them. There are some animals that we study, like zebrafish, where the embryos are transparent, so they're great for microscopy. And object names. So things aren't just one. They, there's always reflect, refraction, diffraction. There's always something happening. But again, we sometimes name them by the main thing that's happening. You've heard of amplitude objects that are kind of opaque and phase objects tend to be transparent and also cause uh, phase shifts. So putting it together, light and matter, light hitting a cell <laughs> will be a little bit reflected, a little bit transmitted, a little bit refracted, absorbed, dispersed, and diffracted, and scattered actually, which is a combo of these. This leads to sometimes to phase shifts. Um, oh, I didn't even mention this. Changes in polarity. That's the uh, my polar microscope, uh, pole scopes are using that. Um, that's actually, polarity is the direction that those waves are oscillating in. And are they oscillating in a complete 360, always at 90 degrees or not? Anyway, um, these, these various disturbances, if we can, um, 
these things that happen to light as they go through your specimen lead them to form an image. We can't see phase differences or polarity differences with our own eyes, but the microscope can use them to generate contrast. That's DIC in phase microscopy. Light is also absorbed and can cause fluorescence. And what we're gonna come back to later is the diffraction is really big in just bright field microscopy, giving you bright field microscopy. So again, just summarizing light can, just organizing it in a different fashion, light can be absorbed and cause fluorescence, it can be diffracted or refracted and change phase, can be polarized, and then um, it can just be diffracted and give us a bright field image. <laughs> And here's a little animation, uh, just for fun, uh, just maybe stirring up some fond memories. Uh, Planck's law describes the quantum energy. So when I say there's, you know, lots of knowledge and equations and math to whether light is a photon, you know, is it a quantum material or is it light? I mean, is it waves? Yes to both. <laughs> and um, these are some cool movies that I hope are still up at these links. And um, this is the, this is just an amazing video. We might watch it during a demo. Um, this is info we got from microscopes animated and showing us um, how the parts of a cell. It's just a really fantastic video. And these are just some cool movies. And that is it for this portion of your class.